Hey guys, welcome to this episode of our video lectures. Uh, the topics of uh, this episode are aggression um, and play. Uh, and uh, intuitively you would think that those two uh, topics are not actually related to one another. But depending on the particular study system that you're uh, uh, focusing on, it can actually be intimately linked. So I'm out here in the uh, central tablelands in New South Wales again and I'm out here doing a project on eastern grey kangaroos. Um, so, uh, as with a lot of macropods, uh, so macropods are kangaroos, wallabies, wallaroos, um, uh, eastern grey kangaroos in particular are sexually sized dimorphic, and specifically male bias sexually sized dimorphic. Now, all that simply means is that males are bigger than females. Um, on average, uh, the uh, typical male is about a third larger than uh, most females. Uh, humans are another uh, sexually sized dimorphic male biased uh, uh, species so men tend to be on average a little bit larger more muscular um, uh, than women. So in the case of uh, eastern grey kangaroos um, males uh, compete for access to females. This is uh, common in the natural world as you know. Um, in uh, these uh, kangaroos, uh, males will uh, form um, uh, harems, so they'll uh, try and monopolize access to uh, the females within those harems. Um, and to defend those harems, uh, they spend a lot of time fighting one another. Um, and uh, these fights uh, can be uh, pretty strenuous, they can be very violent, and they can go on for a very long time. Now, as a consequence of uh, that physical combat, what's happened is that uh, selection has focused on uh, male size. And because, um, as you would imagine, being larger uh, has its benefits when you're uh, getting into a situation um, of physical combat, right? So what has happened is that over time, uh, the selection pressure on males to be large so that they can uh, better fight other males has resulted in this male bias sexual size dimorphism. So males being uh, larger than females. And because of that size advantage um, during uh, physical combat. Now, if you look across all the different species of macropods, um, and they're pretty diverse, as I said, they go from kangaroos, wallaroos, right down to wallabies. There is actually a lot of variation in uh, size dimorphism between the sexes. So eastern kangaroo, eastern grey kangaroos, uh, red kangaroos are at the peak. Uh, the males are the largest um, relative to females. At the other end are things like uh, palmer wallabies, um, swamp wallabies, uh, and these uh, in these species the sexes are roughly quite similar. So they're, they're tending towards monomorphism. So monomorphism is that both sexes are uh, approximately the same size, or on average, they're the same size. So, what I'm trying to get at is if you actually look at uh, the uh, degree of uh, male biased size dimorphism uh, among closely related species, you can actually get a reasonably good idea about what the likely social system, uh, the reproductive system of those species are. So in the case of uh, strong or extreme male bias sexual size dimorphism, these are species that are typically associated with males having to compete directly with one another through fighting uh, for access to females. In eastern grey kangaroos, it's the formation of these harems and defending access to those harems, becoming the dominant male. Um, in other systems, such as lizards, um, males are defending uh, space, so territories, and those territories overlap the home ranges of females. And as a consequence um, of defending those territories, males are, are trying to monopolize access to those females. Um, but if you go down to the other end of the spectrum where the sexes tend to be quite similar in size, you find that you don't have this uh, type of uh, aggression among males uh, for competition, uh, um, uh, for mating opportunities. And often what you see, in particular in macropods, uh, those species that tend to be monomorphic also tend to be uh, relatively uh, um, 
asocial. So you only tend to see one, maybe two individuals at any one time. So swamps wallabies are a particularly nice example of that. In contrast, the eastern grey kangaroos, uh, these guys form very large mobs. Uh, the, uh, at this particular site that I'm at now, um, the average mob this morning was uh, about 60 to 65 uh, individuals. Uh, and within that um, uh, large mob, you'll have these uh, subsets or these groups forming where these males are trying to monopolize access to the females. So, aggression leads to sexual size dimorphism when males are competing uh, physically for access uh, to females. Now the other topic that I was going to talk about today uh, is play behaviour. Now in eastern grey kangaroos, um, the juveniles and sub-adults um, will often spend a lot of time playing, but in particular they'll spend a lot of time play fighting with one another. Um, and there is a lot of uh, um, uncertainty about what the function of play is just generally in the animal world and in the particular case of these eastern grey kangaroos what it is that these uh, play fighting um, uh, uh, functions as. Now often um, we fall into this trap that we observe something in nature and we have to come up with an adaptive ex explanation to it. So it could be that play is simply that. So animals are playing because they enjoy playing, um, so on and so forth. There is, is no uh, particular adaptive reason for it. The flip side is, is uh, that perhaps there is an adaptive um, function to play behaviour, in particular play fighting. One of the hypotheses is that males, uh, as juveniles and sub-adults, are uh, play fighting with um, their peers uh, to effectively get their skill set up, so training themselves for their uh, future role, um, hopefully um, in their minds of being the dominant male uh, and monopolising access to females. So that play, while it's um, not very violent, um, it's a bit of a scrap, it's, um, it's pretty playful, you, you can see that when you're, you, when you're watching it. Uh, there's not a lot of the implications, there's no really a winner or a loser. Um, the idea here is, is that they're um, effectively uh, practicing fighting uh, for later on in life. Um, and that's, an that's a relatively obvious hypothesis, um, but the problem with that hypothesis is, is that that would predict that um, it's mostly the boys that are doing play fighting and the boys play fighting with other boys. Um, but what you see uh, in eastern grey kangaroos is that you see play fighting among uh, uh, boys and girls, so juveniles and sub-adult males and females. Um, females are play fighting with one another, they're play fighting with, um, with the males, sometimes they're even play fighting with mum. So that hypothesis um, could still be viable but it doesn't really explain why uh, females or the girls are play fighting. So the second hypothesis is, is that um, play fighting uh, is uh, its adaptive function, if there is adaptive function, is to cement social bonds, um, in particular uh, social bonds among um, uh, members of the same family, for example, um, uh, social bonds among um, members of a particular group. So these are large mobs of uh, kangaroos but there will often be uh, smaller groups within that larger mob. So this play fighting, this interaction is so, just general social behaviour and again it's there to uh, cement social bonds between members and the idea would be is that those social bonds may actually retain uh, through development um, through into adulthood as well. So you'll tend to see males and females tending to associate uh, based on whether they are associating perhaps play fighting as juveniles. So, um, play in the animal world, as I said, is um, a bit of a puzzle to our researchers. Um, you'll see a lot of animals um, uh, play, and uh, juveniles in particular, but you'll see adults playing as well. Um, you just need to go out to uh, 
Botany Bay, uh, La Perouse, for example, and see the, uh, the dolphins um, playing in the surf at the bows of these cargo ships as they come into Port Botany. Um, there doesn't appear to be any function to that behaviour. They're just jumping out of the water uh, and they appear to be just enjoying themselves. So perhaps, uh, again, this play behaviour uh, has no adaptive significance, but of course it could also be, again, some type of affiliation behaviour, um, cementing those social bonds uh, between uh, particular groups of uh, individuals. So in terms of the uh, study that I'm doing out here, I've been coming out here for a number of years and um, I spent a lot of time in that thing over there. Uh, so that's a hide, if you haven't um, realised that already. It's just a glorified tent, to be honest with you. Um, so uh, eastern grey kangaroos are crepuscular. So a lot of their activity is concentrated around uh, dawn um, and also dusk. So if you want to study their social behaviour, their aggression, their play behaviour, the time to uh, do that is first thing in the morning or late in the afternoon. So I've been in that hide uh, since four o'clock this morning um, and I have a video recorder and also I have a digital camera. So all the work that I'm doing uh, to a large extent is purely observational. It's recording behavior. Um, it's taking photos of uh, uh, individuals. We can actually identify uh, individuals based on the morphology of their ears. We've got a, a special program back in the lab um, that we can uh, trace the uh, shape of the ear and we can use that to identify particular individuals. So each individual has its own unique uh, shape of, of, of the ear. So it's almost like a fingerprint uh, for Eastern Grey Kangaroos. So that's important because I've been coming out here um, for a number of years and been following the same individuals from year to year. Um, so if you want to test a longitudinal hypothesis such as play behavior, uh, is or uh, play fighting specifically is related to um, aggression and uh, 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 real fighting as adults, you need to ideally follow individuals from uh, juveniles and sub-adults all the way through to adulthood and see whether there is a link between uh, the frequency of play behaviour their frequency of play fighting with particular individuals, particular sex of individuals, um, and uh, where those individuals end up in, in the dominant hierarchy later on in life. Um, so identifying uh, individuals is important um, and uh, recording the social behaviour so that we can take it back to the lab and we can record all sorts of things from the uh, overall duration of um, uh, combat, uh, the likely winner of a particular um, bout, um, how many hits, how many uh, uh, instances that we have of the stereotyped behaviour that often uh, starts off physical fights where males uh, do the stereotype scratching um, and they also do a lot of uh, grass pulling as well. Um, it's all standoff um, just before they get into the nitty gritty of getting into physical combat. So I spent a, a lot of hours sitting in a hide um, uh, before dawn um, and recording the, the social behavior of these animals. Um, and I do this uh, for a couple of weeks every year. Um, and with that, I'm able to uh, accumulate a fairly large library of um, who's who in the particular mobs, who's associated with the particular individuals. And I, all, I, I can also get information on who's reproducing. I can see which females are carrying pouch young, uh, which females are interacting with particular males, and so on and so forth. So even through purely observational techniques, sure, we've got some sophisticated shape analysis and of course video recordings at the end of the day it's all observation and you can still get a lot of information and test some hypotheses um, associated with particular behaviors of course you don't really need to have a fancy hide you can park a vehicle leave it overnight it's just as good it's actually more comfortable as well So there's been a lot of research on the potential adaptive significance of forming large groups. 
in the case of these eastern grey kangaroos, uh, individual kangaroos have to face potential predation threat occasionally from dingoes, more commonly from foxes and feral cats. Obviously, as an individual kangaroo, if you're a member of a very large group, you effectively dilute the potential predation threat because there's a whole range of other individuals that that predator could potentially attack. What that means is, being part of large groups means you can devote your activity to other things other than vigilance behaviour, checking in with the surrounding environment, making sure that there are no potential predation threats. And in the case of these eastern grey kangaroos, it means that individual kangaroos can spend more time foraging and also um, finding potential mates if you're a male. Alright guys, that's all I have for you uh, for this uh, episode. I hope you enjoyed it and um, stay tuned for our next one.